Growing up as a child in Queensland's Gold Coast, my family didn't see much point in travelling to exotic locations for holidays. We never went to Fraser Island, New Zealand or Bali because we already lived in paradise. Instead, over the Christmas holiday, we'd visit my nan who lived in a relatively small country town in the central Queensland outback. It was a pleasant enough place that always felt like I was going back in time. The closest shopping mall was a one hour drive away and it remains impossible to get any reception on a mobile phone. However, this was in the late 80s, so this didn't bother me at all. The drive from Gold Coast was 13 hours, not counting stops. In the car were my mum, my dad, my dad's brother Uncle Greg, and of course myself. Uncle Greg would always sit in the back with me and we'd play I Spy until we ran out of subjects to name, while mum and dad sat in the front, usually listening to Cat Stevens most of the drive. My nan was always so excited to see us when we finally arrived. She'd squeeze me into a tight embrace and kiss my forehead. Though at the time I stuck out my tongue in recoil and reacted like most boys my age would, I was always excited to see her. And now, I miss my nan's loving embrace. Nan's house, it was two stories high and we all fit inside very comfortably. The furniture was old, and the smell of bleach was always potent. But, it was clean and homely just the same. During the day, my mum, Nan and I, we'd go into town for lunch, play old board games that my Nan kept on a high shelf in her wardrobe, and I'd help them bake in the kitchen. Meanwhile, my dad and Uncle Greg would go down to the nearby billabong for what I initially thought was fishing. Nan told me that my grandfather used to take them out fishing at the billabong when they were kids. For those of you who don't know what a billabong is, it's an isolated pond or a lake abandoned by a creek or river once it's changed its course. The billabong down near my Nan's house, it was huge, stretching for miles and miles and as I later came to learn, was populated by a heavy number of freshwater crocodiles. The sounds that I would hear, however, in the dead of the night, coming from that billabong, were not the ferocious roars and growls of crocodiles. I remember hearing it for the first time. It was a terrifying, high-pitched howling sound that I can only describe as bearing similarity to a dying horse. Though it was always the middle of summer, the sound of whatever it was, it stung my flesh with chills, and I'd curl myself into a tight ball with my blanket wrapped around me. My suspicions of a monster living in that billabong were first aroused when I caught my dad and Uncle Greg leaving Nan's house with a pair of rifles. Uncle Greg just told me that it was for protecting themselves against crocodiles, but as I started to piece together the puzzle, I realised that Uncle Greg and my father never came back from that billabong with any fish, nor did they ever leave with fishing rods in the first place. As I got older, visiting Nan's hometown was no longer as exciting, and I became less reluctant to play board games and bake. I was nine when I finally asked Dad and Uncle Greg to take me down to the billabong. My father exchanged a concerned look with Mum and Nan. I, I need you to take care of your mother and grandmother while we're gone, champ. But I want to see the billabong, I practically demanded. Sorry, mate, Uncle Greg interjected. It's just not safe. We don't want the crocs to get you. I may have been young, but I was no fool. They were hiding something from me. There was something down at that billabong that my parents were afraid of, and it was not crocodiles. After all, Dad and Uncle Greg used to go there as children. They left for the billabong, 
and my mum forbade me to follow. But I was young and curious. I'd heard the mysterious howling sound every time I'd come to visit, and I decided that it was high time I found out what it was. I waited until mum and Nan began baking, and I slipped out the back door. I trekked through bushland for 45 minutes, not really sure I was heading in the right direction, but continuing on a decline. The air was humid, and it was sticky, and the sun was hidden behind a patch of clouds, filtering my surroundings into a flat contrast. For a while, I thought that I was well and truly lost. But then I heard it. The dreadful howling sound that I'd fear of a night. It only lasted a few seconds, but long enough to give me a direction. I continued, in almost a straight line, until I saw it through the trees. A large bed of brown, murky water, covered in a light, ominous fog. Branches extended from the water close to the embankment, like the bony fingers of a witch. Though it may sound like I've exaggerated the details, this place, it was truly uncomfortable to the senses. I approached, rather reluctantly, towards the water, when I heard a rippling sound. I scanned my surroundings, frozen on the spot, but the surface of the billabong, it remained eerily undisturbed. I could see neither sign of my father and uncle, nor any crocodiles, only dragonflies dancing across the water, and other winged insects buzzing through the air. The fear I thought I'd outgrown as a child, when I first heard that disturbing howl, riddled my entire body almost in an instant. I near regretted disregarding my parents' instruction, but I was here now so I decided to explore. I traversed around the muddy embankment, barely taking my eyes off that water, afraid that something would jump out at me without warning. As I continued, something caught the corner of my eye ahead of me. It was large, dark, and sat in the mud a few feet from the water. I halted, immediately, and I waited for it to move in which case I was prepared to run. But it remained still. I continued to approach it, and it continued to lie still in its place. When I was close enough to see the scales on its skin, I finally recognized what was in front of my eyes. It was a crocodile, but only the back half of a crocodile. Its tail was facing away from the water, and it seemed like the front end had been ripped away. This was no small creature. From what was left of it, I could see thick hind legs and a wide back with a tail that must have been more than four feet long. I was no expert on crocodiles, but I couldn't think of any animal that could leave one in such a shape Unless Dad and Uncle Greg had a rocket launcher, I doubt they were responsible for the dead croc. By this point, I was shaking with fear. The sweat that was dripping down my back, it felt like ice. I continued along the embankment, peering over my shoulder at the crocodile corpse. I eventually came across a cave that dug into the soil where the ground elevated skyward away from the billabong. The entrance wasn't far from the water's edge, and in winter, when the water level was higher, it would most likely flood the cave. I couldn't see how deep this thing was, but from the light, it did show me that there were paintings on the walls. They were in the style of indigenous art. I'd seen similar in museums, on school trips, but this, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. There were people, stick figures, gathered around a fire. And below the fire was what appeared to be a tunnel leading deep underground. 
at the end of the tunnel, a cavern opened up, and inside, a huge creature, three times the size of any of the people above, was painted with a wolf-like head, sharp teeth, and eyes, wide and black. The rest of the cave, it was decorated with handprints, smudged across the walls and... It looked like somebody had pressed their face up against the rock too, with their mouth wide open. What did it all mean? I peered into the cave, wondering how deep it went. Were the cave paintings a warning? I heard an unpleasant crack under my boots, and I looked down. Covering the ground were the bones and skeletons of wild animals. Among the wild graveyard, something caught my eye. I touched it and felt the harsh, rusted metal against my fingertips. It was a bear trap. However, it had been squashed, almost flat. There is no way a crocodile could have done that. As I investigated the cave, I heard the water ripple behind me. I spun around in a panic, goosebumps covering my arms and legs, and my heart racing so fast I could hear it. It took me a few moments before my eyes met with something in the water. Another pair of eyes looking directly back at mine. They were large and black, but they were no crocodile eyes. They belonged to a giant head, covered in dark, brown hair, that only peered out of the surface of the water. Its nose and other facial features, they remained below the surface, but from what I could see, it looked like the head of a giant, nasty dog. The water around this thing, it remained perfectly still. There were no ripples or movement, and I struggled to grasp that what I was seeing was real. As soon as its head ducked back under the water, I bolted back across the embankment. I thought I saw a huge, dark body rise above the surface of the water, travelling beside me as I ran for my life. I felt my right foot drop and my boot It splashed into the water. My body was shaking wildly with fear. I screamed at the top of my lungs, pulling my foot out from the mud beneath the water, and I bolted into the bush, away from that billabong. I refused to look back. With everything happening so fast, it's difficult to recount what was happening. But I could have sworn I heard its massive body heaving itself out of the water behind me, and its ghastly howl ripped through the trees. All of a sudden, I felt myself collide with something. Whatever it was, it was alive, and it knocked me back onto the ground. At this point, I was too afraid to scream, and I shut my eyes tight, praying that whatever it was would leave me alone. Eric! My father's voice never sounded so comforting, despite the anger it was mixed with. What the hell are you doing out here? Everyone's worried sick. I didn't care to apologize or attempt to explain myself. I just launched my arms around my father's waist and refused to let go. With tears streaming down my face, I tried to tell him what I saw. Dad, I saw something. I saw something in the billabong. I saw... You went to the billabong? My dad sounded more frightened now than angry. When we got back to Nan's house, I met some very concerned and temperamental family members. They tried to convince me that what I saw was a crocodile. They told me that some can grow up to nine and a half feet. I know what I saw and so did they. But, I understand their resistance to indulge a nine-year-old boy. Later on that night, 
my nan told me while tucking me in that my granddad had gone missing by the billabong long before I was born. She told me this so that I understood how dangerous it was down there and so that I would promise her never to go to that billabong again. After that summer, I never got another chance regardless. Nan came to visit us instead during the Christmas holidays for three years until she passed away. Uncle Greg still visited Nan's hometown though, even after she passed. It didn't take me long to figure it all out. Whatever that beast in the billabong was, it must have taken my grandfather, my dad and Uncle Greg. They must have been hunting for it whenever we visited Nan. After a while, even Uncle Greg stopped going to Nan's hometown. Maybe he gave up. Maybe he finally killed it. I doubt the latter, though. I can't imagine that much would be able to kill that creature, given its size and implied ferocity. I can never forget that harrowing noise that it made, that frightening howl that I heard through the trees. And sometimes, when I close my eyes, I can still see its own, staring directly into mine. <laughs>